chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28, and uh, we're going to begin in verse 6. We're going to deal with the ephod, so for sure this class is beginning with the ephod. We will see how far we go with that, but we do have several verses here. So beginning in verse 6 of uh, Exodus 28, <clears throat> And they shall, make the, uh, they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet, fine twine linen, with skillful work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and it shall be joined together. All right, so basically the picture of that is the ephod is the outward covering and it's two pieces, the front and the back. And then it has these shoulder pieces that join it together. All right. Then verse 8, And the beautifully woven girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the children of Israel. Six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, thou shalt engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in settings of gold. Thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. Therein shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Thou shalt make settings of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends of braid work shalt thou make them and fasten the braided chains to the settings. <clears throat> All right, so again, the ephod was the out, outward garment. Now there were, there's a lot of garments that the high priest wore, but this is the outward thing. And um, it was made of blue and red and purple, and it had fine beaten lines of gold running through it, woven into it. And these all speak of a certain aspect of this outer garment that uh, we are supposed to be wearing. Let me give you, keep your place here, mark it, because we'll be back, but uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> We're going to look at verse 11 and verse 12. Second Timothy 2.11 It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And we'll just stop there. I, interestingly enough, I went into great detail on the rest of this when I was in Arkansas last time. But um, I just want to deal with this right here, and I want you to see the comparisons here where it begins saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. And it's running that parallel to if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. The first thing to notice is that we are neither dead nor alive without him. If we be dead with him, we shall live with him. Not if we be dead with him, we shall live. But if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. And there is this withness 
this withness of being with the Lord in relationship to what he is going through. Because we're not, he's not dead with us. We're dead with him in his death. It was his death. It wasn't our death. It became our death. But only because we were with him. And it became our resurrection only because we are with him. And of course, we know that that word with means more than just hanging out with or walking along beside. It's talking about in oneness with him. And so um, it, it sort of weaves our life together in with his. And it sort of brings us into whatever it is that he's going through we actually are only partakers of his sufferings. We only are partakers of his reigning. Folks, just because you suffer doesn't mean you reign. I mean, if that were true, everybody in India would be kings because they're suffering a lot. You know? I mean, all of the all of the really poor people sleeping under bridges or whatever, they, because they're suffering. But it's not just suffering, because there is a lot of suffering that's going on that has nothing to do with him. But if we suffer, and that suffering is with him, interwoven with him, then we shall reign with him, because why? Well, let me just say it like this. There seems to be a religious concept that is believed that says if you're a Christian and you suffer the result of that is you get to reign okay you, anybody ever heard that but folks the suffering is his sufferings we're entering into the sufferings of Christ and the reigning folks is because God set Christ up to be king of kings and lord of lords the reigning there is no the reward for suffering is not becoming a king you see what I'm saying? I mean, that's almost the mentality we have, that the reward for suffering is that he'll make you a king. That's not what this is saying. It is saying, if you're going through suffering with him, then if you're still with him when he's raised, then you will reign with him too. Now, that said, and hopefully that, that captured, <clears throat> that means that there are... Um, two very distinct relatings with Jesus that have to be understood on our part to be with. One is to suffer. And what that means to him and to us, to him and then to us in union with him. And the other one is to be raised and what that means, and when I say what that means, I'm not just talking about head knowledge. I'm talking about how does Jesus relate in suffering, not just going through suffering, but being with him in suffering. Does that make sense? You know, the Lord dealt with me uh, not too long ago, and I think I might have mentioned it in one of my last classes, and then Deb shared it with me again today about being patient in suffering. It didn't just say suffer, it said be patient and suffer and you're waiting for something I, I have been reminded even the last couple of weeks that um, be that for me being patient in suffering is not being patient until let's say the people who are making me suffer are judged or punished do you understand that's not that's not going on in me I'm waiting for the grace of God to reach them I'm waiting for the wonderful grace that is the Lord. Forget, forget them in that sense. Remember the Lord. Remember the compassion. Remember the mercy. Remember the love that he has. Remember that we serve a miracle-working God. You know, you, you know you look at, you, we can look at somebody and say, well, that, that's a hard case or that's an impossible. Well, with men, it is impossible. Honestly, with men, if men stay men, all it takes is one entrance. 
The entrance of thy word giveth light, or the entrance of his life giveth life. You're instantly changed into that same image because it is him now. One moment it was you, now it's him. How much time does it take? It can begin instantly. So I'm excited. I'm waiting. I'm in anticipation of uh, waiting patiently for the grace of God, not to reach me, come to think of it. It didn't even occur. <laughs> but to reach them, you know? And there's, there's an excitement. There's an anticipation that goes with that. And it's woven into this thing of patience where you're patient because just suffering, folks, people suffer, and a lot of times they're not patient with it. You know what I mean? I don't like this. Lord, do something, you know. Or you've heard the old saying, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now, which shows there's no patience at all if you're saying now, you know. But the answer isn't patience. The answer is woven, being woven into the Lord's suffering where there is all resources, including patience, and love, and joy, and peace, and gentleness. Now, you know, now that I'm on that subject, I might as well say this one thing. I think that there is a misunderstanding for some people that they think if it's the lamb, that you go through suffering, but you don't really feel anything. <laughs> okay. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You tell me that's not feeling stuff pretty deeply? You tell me that? And he was the Lamb of God. <laughs> the Lamb of God. You know, it doesn't mean you don't feel stuff. It doesn't mean you don't hurt. It doesn't mean that there's not pain and stuff. It means that it's not that and that alone. There's hope. There's hope, and there's always hope. There's always hope, but only in the Lord. There's never hope. If you, you look at the situation long enough, and you will become hopeless. Can I get an amen from somebody? Because, you know, either that situation is you, I'm hopeless, or you turn it to the person that's giving you problems, you're hopeless. You know? And those, you know, let's just say that that's true. They're hopeless. And you're hopeless. But God has answers, and there is hope in the Lord. There's hope, but only in the Lord. So, you know, as you know and well know, so the answer is to get your eyes off of the problem and get your eyes onto Jesus. And when you do that, you'll be okay. But it doesn't mean you don't have any pain. Doesn't mean that there's not, get ready, suffering. There's, there's suffering. I'm going to say it like this, whether this is correct or not, it'll convey something, hopefully. To whatever degree you suffer, you might reign. What if that were the case? So if you're suffering a lot, what if that you were going to partake of the risen Lord? The, the risen Lord, anybody know what I'm talking about when I say the risen Lord? I'm talking about the one we're seated in, the one that we're one with. I'm talking about being a partaker or with him in resurrection or with him in reigning instead of just suffering and never fully comprehending the other side. Okay? Okay. And there were some, you know, let's face it, there were some like in the book of Hebrews who uh, didn't allow deliverance that they might have a better resurrection. That's almost unheard of in Christianity today. That you would actually not receive deliverance because the deeper the death, the greater the resurrection. No, 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 I want out. I want out of this situation, or I want, I want it remedied now, okay? And the Lord is merciful, and he does help us. I'm just saying, suffering is connected to reigning. Death is connected with living with him. Di dying with him, 
dead with him, and live with him. That's what verse 11 is talking about. And so there is this, this connection. And this connection is not being with the Lord in recreation and in hard times. It's being with the Lord in death and suffering and being with him in life and in resurrection or reigning. Okay? And so those, those are two important factors because they relate here to this whole thing of the ephod. When you go back and you can turn back there to Exodus again, Exodus 28. When you consider the ephod, it was the, the I'll, I'll say it like this and then explain myself. The two primary colors were scarlet and blue. Scarlet representing that same thing that the blood does, uh, not just forgiveness of sins, but a poured out life. A poured out life. And folks, that poured out life is here on earth. Okay? You, this is, you know, if you're ever going to pour your life out for God and others, this is where you're going to do it. If you're wondering why you're doing it now, <laughs> it's because there's not going to be quite the opportunities and glory that there is right now. Okay? And then this is the place of death, but in resurrection we have been raised with him, and there is that blue that's also woven into the garment that is our outward garment. And so... Um, as I began to meditate on this, it said that there was red and blue and purple. But I realized that when you take the poured out life and the living from above and the, the, the situation of seeing things from above, and uh, uh, I wrote, one who sees based on what's done above, living by life from above and not earth life. When you take one who's pouring out his life in the earth, but he's seeing that when you mix red and blue together, you get purple. And purple is the king, is to reign, it's royalty. You see? That's why you reign with him, because even in the suffering, even in the pouring out of your life, even in the, the dying and the suffering, amen? being dead with him and then also suffering with him, even in all of that, even in the pouring of that out, you are still seeing everything from above and that's why you're not just being murdered, you're a poured out life. You're not just being, someone isn't just grabbing you and making you suffer and go through things for Jesus. You're doing it because you comprehend the poured out life, which is the Lamb. And you comprehend that you also reign with Him and that you have been raised with Him and that you live right now with Him in life above. And when you mix those two together, guess what? You can't help but reign with Him on high, if you understand what I mean. And that's why the purple is more a result of the mixture of those two elements. Okay. Now let me explain it on another front. Jesus, you could say that before the foundation of the world, Jesus was king. I don't know that he was, but you could say that he was. And if he was, if he sat on a throne as a king, he did so because he was the best man for the job. Or he did so because he was deity. Amen? That's not why he sits on that throne now. You can study that out in Philippians. He sits on that throne now because Paul described in Philippians, let this mind be in you. Well, you know, let's save our place here and go to Philippians. It, I, I, I can read it better than I can quote it, and I can quote it pretty well from years of considering it. It's Philippians 2. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Okay, now, it is, 
If you wonder what mind is talking about, you can automatically finish the sentence and say, well, say it's the mind of Christ, but it is the mind described in verse 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. How many of you honestly have let the mind of Christ be in you to such a degree that to, uh, at this point in your life, you let pretty much nothing be done through strife? Or vain glory, seeking glory in, uh, for vanity's sake. How many of you are like 50% there? Never mind. We'll just. The point is, many of us, if we didn't come at it from that approach and we came at it strictly from a knowledge sense of the no, what is the mind of Christ in knowledge, we might think that we've got a lot of the mind of Christ. But this is describing that. And then it goes, you know, it goes on to say, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Okay, now let's face it. There's nobody better than you. <laughs> you know, what, what would be the point of esteeming them when, uh, better when they're not? That would be a lie. See, that's the way we think. That's not the mind of Christ. That's our mind at work. And then he goes on, um, verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. Can anybody say, oh, me? I mean, amen. Because that is where the Holy Spirit wants to take us. Why? Because we're a priest. Because we're supposed to be wearing these garments. Because that's what people see. The ephod is the outermost garment. And they see this mixture of a poured out life. And yet, someone who lives above all of that. Someone who sees what's done there and can draw from it. And mixes that red and blue together. And now back to Jesus, because this, this continues on. Let's see, it's, it's talking, now it starts talking about Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of, of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore? You see the word wherefore? Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. You see, you know the rest of that. Folks, this one, this king, this royal one was raised up because he mixed blue and purple, or blue and, and red together, and got purple. He got purple which is royalty. God made him king because of this spirit and this mixture of this reality of giving yourself and yet never losing hope. And I can't, you know what, I, I have to back up. I can't say never losing hope, but I can say basically not losing hope because you look at Abraham right on through and they all had times of, we're talking about our basic walk. We're not talking about perfection. Okay? Because everybody has down times, and that's okay. The main thing is, what is, is there a foundation? When the sand starts sifting away from our feet, do we eventually land on a rock that's underneath it all? When it's all been sifted away? That's the question. And so, there is this, um, this mixing together to form the one who should rule, the one who should be king. And that's Jesus, and that's his body. I'm going to say it like this. That's his body parts that have let this mind be in them. Because remember, we are the body of the high priest. So we wear this garment. The head does not wear the ephod. The body wears the ephod. Okay? And so there is this this outward show of these realities. And then, of course, of course, of course, of course, 
fine threads woven all through that of gold, and gold representing deity, because it is, it is this interweaving of the treasure and the earthen vessel. Is it not? Is it not? Is it not just totally transform into Jesus, or is it not let him be formed in you, but you will always be an earthen vessel, but you will have this treasure in you. Is it not a mixture of those things? Is not that fine gold woven into us in everything, in all things, all the way through, so that it's not even fully, you know, don't you know how I many talks about rewards? Well, you got to get do something to get a reward, but it's not all us. It's not all us. If God if God tells us to go minister to someone to his glory, we may be the hand extended, but he's the one that ministers to them because you you can't heal them and you can't fix them. <laughs> okay? So, so you see that you're woven through and through with these golden threads that are Christ, but you also are woven through with these realities that work in you, that work in you. And all of it together makes this garment that the body is covered with, but the head, the face is seen. The body is covered with, but the face is seen. We know who it is when we see the face. We know it's Jesus. And, every, and, and, and the important part of what, about what I'm saying right now, because you can take that two ways, we know it's Jesus because the thread has been so woven in that we know it's not us. But on the other hand, once that garment is on a cover in the body and being worn by the body, and the head is being carried forth with that, other people look and they don't see the body. They see the principle of the reality there. If they want to see beyond the principle of the reality, they just look into the face, and when they do, they see Jesus. They don't see us. They see the high priest. They don't see us. We're covered. We're covered. And we're covered over with reality. And I, I like to use that word a lot instead of truth. Because truth can be a cerebral sort of thing, uh, an intellectual thing. But reality is, this is what's real. And it's real in me. And, and folks, that's what we need, my God. We don't need any more teaching of truths. You know, you get to a place where you, you're just sort of sick of truths, but and you've got a choice. You can be sick of truth and then show, throw out all teaching sessions and everything, or you can be sick of truth and you can be like a spy going into the truth class to get reality. That's, that's the way I feel it. You're, you're, you're a spy and you've slipped in and you're looking for Jesus. You're looking for life. You're looking for the real thing. You're looking for something that brings reality to this whole thing instead of a bunch of teaching and a bunch of going through the motions which ends nowhere. I mean, the best that can end, if, if you stay only on that track, is you can end up being the top Pharisee. The top Pharisee in your class. Anybody up for that? Or you can, or you can get low, and you can listen to everything, and you can, you can just... You're just waiting patiently. You're just waiting on the Holy Spirit. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. Speak life to me. Give me something that will transform, that will change, that will add to all the other reality that I have. Even if, if it be ever so small, it's better to have a little ball of reality than almost no reality and just be full of all sorts of stuff that you can spout to people and impress them. And it's not about impressing people. So, so we see that, that he says, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Why? Because he mixed these two colors together. Because they were uh, 
put together because without the other two, there would be no purple. There would be no raining. It would just be um, someone, uh, kind of like in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it is nothing. Folks, if there wasn't any other scripture that tells you that it's not what you do, but the Spirit, and that one does, <laughs> you know, it, there's not virtue in what you do, there's virtue in the motive behind what you do. If the motive is selfish or, sel or self-centered, then it, there is no, it, 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 it counts for, it is nothing, 1 Corinthians 13 says. But if it is love or self-giving nature, God is love, God is, you know, doesn't exalt himself, does not seek his own, does not, I mean, listen to all of it, folks. It clearly is describing something that is self-giving. It is not de just describing at just various attributes. It is describing a nature and how that nature functions and that to God, that and that alone must be woven in or it's not virtuous at all. It must be the motive behind the red. It must be the motive behind the blue. And if it is, the result is purple. Then you shall reign with him. No question about it. No question about it. All right. Uh, one sentence here I've got. We do not reign with Jesus unless we have suffered with him, red, and passed that suffering by living from above, blue. <laughs> Does that make sense? You, you want me to read it again? I went pretty quick there. We do not reign with Jesus unless we have suffered with him, red, and passed that suffering by living from above, blue. And you mixed them both together, and you will reign with him. <clears throat> All right, let's just uh, look at a few other scriptures in relationship to this before we move to another part of the ephod. Um, Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. All right. Here is a description of the blue. Amen? It's, it's meant to be woven into your being. It's meant to be, and the word if is really the word since in the original Greek, since you are risen with Christ, because why? Because in reality you are risen with Christ. But he's basically saying just because you're risen with Christ doesn't mean necessarily that you act like it. Does being risen with Christ automatically make you function as one with him or with him? And the answer is apparently not. Uh, you know, we could say that apparently not because this scripture says that, or we could say apparently not because we could look at you or me or anyone else, okay? But since you're risen with Christ, then you need to start seeking the blue. You need to start coming from there where Christ sits at the right hand of God. You need to set your affections there. All right. One of the things about suffering is that it helps you get your affections off the earth. You know, a person that has been through a lot of suffering and rejection and, and despised of men really, really after a while realizes there's nothing down here for me. I mean, I had the thought not that long ago uh, what was I reading? Um, it might have been Joseph and reading about the life of Joseph and that Joseph lived to be 110, if, if, it's, if this is the right one. He said, Joseph lived to be 110. And I thought, God, please, no. I, I just, 
No, no, no. You know, that's getting close to double what I've already gone through. <laughs> you know, now, you know, I mean, my wife's going, no, that's not a bad thing. Live to 110, but nonetheless, your, your affections began to be drawn away from the, the I'm going to say the romanticism that we had when we were young of what we thought we would do. Has anybody ever been discouraged because, I mean, you can even do this when you're young. You thought your life was going to go a certain direction and you get a certain age and you look around and you go, this is nowhere near where I thought I'd be, you know, or not, this was not what I wanted or what I expected or whatever, you know. Well, I don't know that too many people ever live up to what their expectations were. You know, I never saw it, but there was a movie out not too long ago called The Bucket List, and I understand that the premise of the movie was that these two old guys, I don't know if they were dying or what because I never saw the movie, but they were old and they, they made a list of stuff they wanted to go do before they died, you know. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna make everything all right. I mean, if there's problems in your family, if there's junk still in you that you hadn't got out and you really don't like it, and there's, you know, go, st and I don't know what their list was or what they did, but standing on top of Mount Kilimanjaro is not going to take all that away or fix it all. You will be able to say on your dying bed, I stood on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, and the nurses will go, what? Where's that at? What's that? What? You know. Oh, it was really cool. Yeah, I'm sure it was. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so, uh, another scripture here, First, first Peter, <clears throat> chapter 4. And here we have the red scripture. Interestingly enough, the last election, our country was divided into red and blue. It never mixed. <clears throat> All right, here's our red scripture. <laughs> First Peter 4, um, verse 12. We'll do 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy. All right, several things here that I don't think are immediately evident. One is the apostle is calling us beloved. And he's saying, beloved, don't think it's strange that you're going through fiery trials. I mean, I've been through trials, but fiery trials. You know, I mean, a fiery trial is different than a trial. You know, it's the difference between 95 and 105 temperature. That's a fiery trial. <laughs> Sorry, little Texas alluding to here. <clears throat> fiery trial, which is to test you, don't, but don't think it's as though some strange thing happened unto you. Some strange thing. In other words, a strange thing, don't think it's strange. In other words, you will become no stranger to fiery trials. You will not be a stranger to them. Okay? But I want you to notice carefully what it says. It says, but rejoice, and here's what we say. Okay, I'm going through this trial, so I'm supposed to rejoice. Whoopee! Isn't this fun? 
This is just exceptionally fun, good, good, good. It's not saying that at all. Look at what it says. But rejoice in as much. Didn't you ever notice the word in as much there? But rejoice in as much. You can rejoice this much. Right? Isn't that in as much? In as much? This much? Rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. He's not telling you to be glad with exceeding joy right now. Did you hear what it said? We always want to read, now, you're supposed to be glad right now. If you're really the Lamb of God, if you're really one with him, you'd just be jumping up and down and shouting for glory because this is, you know, no, you can rejoice in as much as at least this is the sufferings of Christ and not just me suffering for what I did wrong. Can I get an amen? I mean, that's really, you know, that's, that is almost all you can pull out of it. <laughs> However, there is a point where you can rejoice with exceeding joy. But it doesn't say in the suffering. It says, when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And I believe that that glory relates to suffering and reigning, death and resurrection, being with Christ in death, and being with Christ in glory, or in when he is being glorified. So, um, you see from these two scriptures that there is a trial, there is a suffering, there is a red thread woven into literally your being, but certainly into what it is that you put on every day. And... And there is this reality, folks, that we are supposed to set our affections. We're supposed to be looking above and living even through that suffering by our oneness in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and with him. All right, just uh, back to Exodus 28, and I'll try to wrap this up uh, on the ephod, and that way we can have actually one class that is totally what it says it is without <clears throat> and that's uh, Exodus 28 um, 12 verse uh, 9 is where we, we read and thou shalt take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the children of Israel six of their names on one stone and the other six names on the rest of the other stone according to their birth okay and so there is the, these stones are part of the ephod. If you didn't know that, they are not part of the breastplate. The breastplate has 12 stones. The ephod has two stones. The breastplate has 12 individual stones. The ephod is, has this connecting thing that is, the, the stones are set in gold and become a connector between the front of the ephod and the back of the ephod and are carried on the shoulders. The ephod has two stones. The breastplate has 12. The ephod stones are on his shoulders. The breastplates are on his heart. The two stones have six stones here, six names, sorry, six names on this one stone and six names on this stone. The breastplate has all of the individual tribes named and written into the stone. All right. And when you begin to mix these two together, you begin to compare them, either mix them together or compare them, you begin to uh, look at the, first of all, the ephod, because that's the main thing that we're talking about, you see that this is something that he bears in a whole different way than he bears the 12 on his heart. A completely different way. 
the woven red and blue that makes purple with the gold that is also woven in there is held on by these connectors of the 12 that the high priest is carrying the responsibility on his shoulders, that the high priest is bearing the responsibility for them. Now, just to contrast that, the 12 stones are on the breastplate where it is not bearing the responsibility, but it speaks of love, of intimacy, of, of being on his heart, not just needing help, not, you know, this is, the, res the shoulders is where you need someone with responsibility to come help you. You understand the contrast that I'm trying to make there? But this, but the breastplate is the individual stones on his heart. He does this out of love and not out of need. All right. There's a lot of scriptures I could share on this, but um, our time's getting short. We may go to a few <clears throat> Some people are able to comprehend that the Lord is God. The Lord is God. How about this one? You say this in a lot of congregations and they respond immediately. God is good all the time. Okay? That's the goodness of a responsible God. We're talking about God. We're not talking about the husband, we're not talking about the beloved, we're not talking about, you know, the groom. We're just talking about God being good all the time, and therefore God will help you. And that's good to know. Amen? It's good to know. But there's more to it than that. And in that case, they're on black onyx with just 12 or 6 written on one, 6 written on the other. They're not so much individualized. They're not seen in different stones. They're not seen as different stones. They are seen as basically a group that the high priest has responsibility for as a leader. All right. And it's, folks, it's good. It is good to know the Lord in those ways. There's no question about it. There's no question about it. It is good to know the Lord in those ways, that he, that he cares as one who will, can meet your need. For example, I mean, I'm just, the scripture over in uh, 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter 5. I think. Yeah. First Peter 5, 7. Really, you're not going to get the full meaning unless you go back to 6. Humble, your, humble yourselves. Notice yourselves, all 12 of you. <laughs> humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, him who? God. Verse 6. For he careth for you, be sober, be vigilant, your adversary, the devil. Does this sound like a, a love phrase here? Or does this sound like someone who will fight the devil, who will stand with you, who, will, who cares about you, but, you know, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? Anybody seeing that there is that shoulder responsibility? Um, let me put it another way. A woman could meet a man, let's say that they're both going to college over here, and she sees attributes in him that are really good, all right? She sees that he is responsible, which is a big thing for women, real big, huge, because it brings security and women need security, so it's huge, all right? Um, she sees that he's got money or the wherewithal or the power wherewithal to help her, uh, that he um, has manners, 
He opens the door and, and the car door and all this kind of stuff and does that because he was raised with good manners. So she ends up marrying the guy because she sees that he bears these stones upon his shoulders. But once she gets into the relationship, she finds that even though that she's got security and even though she's got a big house and even though she's got a nice car, <laughs> he's not really very affectionate. And he really, you know, he does what he does because he's a good man, but not necessarily because he's really, really in love with her. Can anybody get the contrast? I think uh, the Eagles did a song similar to this. I don't remember. You got to hide your lion eyes or something like this where a young girl marries this old guy and all this stuff. And she had all this stuff, but she doesn't have love and affection and that sort of thing. All right. Well, regardless of, you know, because let's face it, there are guys that would madly fall in love with a girl, but they have no responsibility at all. You understand? And they don't, they can't keep a job and they can't do, you know what I mean? And so even though he's madly in love with, and you're madly in love with him, regardless of what people think, love won't solve everything. But our high priest, not me or you or anyone. Our high priest, he carries both of these. He carries both of them. And it's good to know, it's good to know when it comes to an area of responsibility, he's going to show up. It's also good to know that sometimes he shows up not because it's, it even requires need or help, but heart and love that he shows up and he does what he does, not out of compunction of guilt or need or problems, simply because it's in his heart. Okay. So I just think that these uh, two placements are more than instructional. They are meant to, first of all, show us what our high priest is like, but since the body wears these things, it's also meant to show us what his body is like. That would be us. <laughs> that would be what we're like. That we actually are bearing his responsibility because we're his body. But he's the head, so it's his strength and insight and everything. We are bearing his love to others because we're his body, but it, it emanates from him through us. And therefore, God is working into us because, you know, folks, I'm telling you, I'll give you another example and I'll try to quit. I don't know how much, how much time we got back there. All right. You can be, you can be a powerful minister for God. I mean, God can use you in incredible ways. But I'm here to tell you, if you don't know some things about finances, and I'm, I'm telling you truthfully now, if you don't know some things about finances, it don't matter how anointed you are or how good you are, you, will, you can be in trouble all the time, and it can mess you up so much that you don't really get the opportunity to minister like you should because you're so messed up in your finances. We've had people come through this Bible school, I'm telling you, and, and because they couldn't handle their finances, there was always this fretting and worry. They never could get on with the Lord because they were too worried about their situation. You know? And so, so I'm just telling you, um, it's not about passion for Jesus alone. But also, you can be, you know, and I'm sorry I'll use this term, you can be anal and really be good with finances and be good with administration and have no passion and no life. And what good is that? And I'll tell you, it's good in certain realms, but it's not good to the Lord. Do you understand what I just said? It, certain realms will always accept that, you know. The, for example, the annual gathering of the 
of the order of the Pharisees. They love you to come and speak. But the Lord is looking for that which is after his kind, shoulders and heart, heart and shoulders, for it to work together as one. All right, I have a lot more scriptures, but I think we'll go ahead and take a break and come back in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs>